Chair for Manufacturing Research at Tennessee Tech University in Cookville, Tennessee. Welcome to the Fall 2020 Golden Eagle Additively Innovative Virtual Lecture Series. This is the 10th semester we have produced this popular and informative series. The series is hosted by TTU Center for Manufacturing Research and the iMaker Space at TTU. Additive manufacturing is a focus of both entities and as such, this short virtual lecture series has been planned to highlight the best practices, potential problems, technological advancements, innovations, and scientific contributions in additive manufacturing with expert talks from various institutions, industries, R&D centers, and laboratories. Today, we are honored to hear from Eric Wooldridge, professor at Somerset Community College in Kentucky. His talk is titled Mass Production and Decision-Making with Low-Cost Additive Manufacturing for Institutions and Small Businesses. When the presentation is over, the speaker will provide his contact information for questions, and we ask that you complete the quiz that has been sent to you in the chat box. Thank you, and I turn the presentation over to Eric. Uh, thank you, Michelle, and uh, welcome, everyone. We do appreciate your time today and uh, just joining us to share a little bit of what we've experienced. Uh, as mentioned, I am at Somerset Community College and we are part of the Kentucky Community and Technical College Systems, 16 sites around the state of Kentucky focused on two-year degrees, pre-engineering, advanced manufacturing, and of course, additive and 3D printing. I'm located at the Somerset campus specifically and we are the lead for the additive manufacturing program for the state. Our job is to actually push it out or develop and push out material and curriculum to 16 colleges across and uh, do best practices for them and, and get their workforce up to speed. We are funded, of course, by the USDA Rural Development Program, National Science Foundation, EPSCoR, and ATE. And our overall goal is to actually create a, give Kentucky workforce an advantage through additive manufacturing. Assuming that people have 3D printers and 3D printing skills, that generally leads to innovation and that's what we want. Um, our overall goal with these companies and actually putting that into the workforce is through what we refer to as low cost additive manufacturing. Uh, 3D printers that are generally less than $1,000, sometimes less than $700 or $400. And we see the success by starting small. So moral of the story is this, we show companies how to use a $600 printer to make money and they'll take it from there. By having that one breakthrough or that one little bit of success, they move on to bigger and better things, more printers, more advancements, and uh, more skills, which turns around and gets their company excited and goes from there. We found this model to be very effective, and that's why we focus on low cost equipment, but high quality production uh, this much. So the moral or the major part of our story starts with the word we're all familiar with nowadays, and that is COVID. It's my new excuse for everything. If I uh, can't get a haircut, can't find a table at a restaurant, don't seem to be able to get my uh, classwork turned in on time, COVID is the excuse. And this has changed the way that we do so many things, especially when it comes to manufacturing. When the pandemic hit, started spreading, we saw the breakdown of so many things that we took for granted, especially our supply chain. The fact of the matter was this, companies were shutting down, transportation was being blocked, materials were being rejected, and this system, this system that was already precarious to begin with, broke in and we couldn't get what we needed, which is kind of ironic in some ways considering how much resource and energy and education has gone into supply chain risk management. And yet here we were unprepared. And we weren't able to get the things that we really, really needed. Things like personal protection equipment. We needed ways to find a, a workaround to the supply chain breakdown problem. And fortunately for our industry, that solution came in a small little box. Generally, 3D printers nowadays on your desktop models will be less than $1,000. And uh, a lot of companies prior to this had already started setting up workshops with tens and fifties and hundreds of 3D printers uh, about desktop size being used to produce what they already needed within their company. And so when the pandemic hits and they can't get face shields and you can't get uh, face masks, these companies stepped up and said, you know what, we're here to help. We will dedicate our 3D printing farm system, the platform that we already have in, in, in functionality and start making what you need. And uh, this was actually seen around the world. Companies stepped in, hobbyists who had two or three printers stepped in 
all of these folks were able to help our communities simply because they had a 3D printer and they were able to use it effectively. And they were able to start thinking about mass production. During that time, there were lots of PPE production going on. We saw everything from face shields to the ear savers to keep the stress off your mask that actually go around to making um, face masks themselves. Even products that were literally keeping people alive were starting to be 3D printed. And so the stories of success were really impressive. There was a lot of uh, realization that if, you know, of any age and any background, you could actually assist in this pandemic if you knew how to run a 3D printer. So it was an unparalleled opportunity for low cost additive manufacturing to demonstrate its ability, its metal, its ability to adapt and provide what was needed to handle the situation. And interestingly enough, it was also a great opportunity for us to collect so much data that we didn't anticipate. And so we were in the middle of like everyone else. Our response was like all the other universities and colleges and companies that had 3D printers, we fired up our banks of printers and started producing products that people needed within our region. Primarily face shields were made. Um, that was what was requested mostly from our hospitals, our first responders, uh, you had your nursing homes, your uh, daycare centers. They wanted the face shields, so that's what we focused on. We also did ear savers and those kind of things, but mostly face shields. And we fired up roughly around 50 to 60 different printers in process and just started making. And through that, we learned a lot. There were a lot of lessons actually to be learned in this process. And so that's our topic today is like from this experience, making this or making that in large quantities, what did we learn and going forward, how can we apply it to companies that want to start producing for themselves, whether it's a commercialized product, maybe it is PPE, but whatever it is, you can start thinking about how to set up your own 3D printer farm or use your equipment to start thinking about mass production. And what we found is that successful transitioning using low cost 3D printing to higher volume production requires a lot of forethought and decision making. You have to really give it some thought before you jump into this. You just don't jump in and start printing because you won't have a very high success rate. There are three primary categories of decision making that we found are necessary to make that transition step. Breaks down to this, design, cycling, and maintenance. And when I say design specifically, I'm not just talking about the design of your product, the CAD model itself. I'm talking about that plus the slicer software that's going to tell the printer what to do. It's a combination of them both. You have to work within both at the same time within your mind to make a good solution. Cycling, that's just the number of times that or the hours between the printer running and stopping. And so, or basically some start to finish on a product. We wanna talk about that. And of course, maintenance keeping the machines going. So we begin our conversation with some few questions. And one of the primary questions that you have to ask yourself, if you're thinking about stepping up and starting to use these 3D printers away from prototyping and one or two offs to actually like fives and tens and twenties and hundreds, your first question to ask is, how big is your team? That's gonna be the primary thing that you need to think about because it's gonna make a big difference in your strategy for volume production. And during the pandemic, universities had actually all kinds of workforce sitting right there in their dorms with nothing else to do but volunteer and assist. But small businesses and companies, institutions like us, uh, in other cases, we weren't allowed to have anyone on a campus. So we basically were dealing with small teams. So that's your first question to ask yourself. We'll come back around to it in cycling, but it does matter. The next question to ask yourself is what's your design flavor? If you are the person that really likes to focus on the CAD side of things and design the model and maybe just take that file and put it into your slicer and let it print, uh, that's not going to work out well for you. You have to have a duality. You have to be thinking of both at the same time and not see them as two separate softwares, but see the whole process and logic of each together. For example, you know, you have control. If this is your product and this is your design and you have the printers, you have control of not only the model's design, but you have the ability to lay it out. You have control of the printer speed. And most importantly, you have the ability to make non-essential features that are essential added to your design. You know, let's just say you wanna print some baby groups there. You have to deal with the fact that one arm is at an angle and has to be printed, hopefully without support. You also have to deal with the fact the fingers hang down and do need support. 
And the question is, do you let the slicer handle that or do you design it in yourself as part of the model? Those are the things that you have to be thinking about since you control the design. Another thing within your design, you have to consider what you are looking for in terms of your production. Do you want to go the fast ninja approach? Maybe the slow stack. But the fast ninja, of course, is we're going to print one quickly, take it off the printer, print another one quickly, take it off the printer, and keep on going. You know, it's more intensive, but it's fast. And if it fails, you only lose one part. You go the slow stacked approach, where you're actually stacking vertically, and you want that printer running as long as you possibly can. The risk there is if it goes bad, you might lose a lot of parts. Maybe you want to go in the middle, the flat spread, taking one part, laying it out several places, as many as you can get on the build plate. Of course, we'll use face shields as the examples here, but laying them out so that, you know, if the failure's, the failure's there, it's not too big of a deal. You're not having to watch the printer nearly as much for clearing, and you don't have as much up and down times with uh, warm up and cool downs. So maybe the flat spread's for you. But in any of those cases, you make your decision on which way you want to go, based on your team size and also your design setup. Another thing about design that you're going to have to deal with is the fact that you're going to have to deal with the curling effect. You know, the residual thermal stress where the part wants to peel itself off the build plate. And adhesion, adhesion, adhesion is your primary thing to think about there. And so what we learned about during the pandemic and during our production is that to address the adhesion, we really focused on compressing that first layer, going really slow that first layer. We would actually set ours down to around 20 or 30% of the normal print speed for just that first layer. We would compress it down even more, maybe a little bit past what's considered a good compressive layer. And now you can get away with that, by the way, depending on the cross section of your shape where we're doing these face shields. They're very band-like, very thin. They didn't have a lot of cross-sectional area. So therefore we could actually get by with a little bit more compression without clogging. Now, if you had a big flat bottom type of object, a base or something with just a big surface area across the bottom, you won't be able to get away with that. You'll have to keep it a little bit higher, and especially if you start seeing bubbling, that means you're actually too tight and you need to pull back. So that matters in terms of your performance. Um, speed really, really matters. What you want at the end of the day is you want that first layer to be compressed down into that build plate. Not so much that it clogs, but so much that you can actually get a good adhesion with that first layer to the build plate itself. Along those same lines, we went the slow stacking approach because we wanted our printers running a long period of time. You want to actually crank up that heat bed. Generally, we were running our beds at 80 to 90 C, and we were compressing that first layer, and we had great, great adhesion. What also we would do, since we were stacking so many vertically, we would add something to the design. We would add a hold pad right where we knew the actual extremities were gonna be and wanna curl off. And so the combination of that hole pad, which is a very little thin disc, it's just basically a little cylinder, very, very, a layer too thick at, at tops, that actually binds down to that build plate during that first layer, connects the part, and it's easy to tear off once you actually pull the part off the plate. And what was really beautiful about it is with the combined temperature, that compressed first layer, when the parts were done and you can cool it down, you could literally hear it popping loose. And so by the time we actually got to room temperature, we came by to clear it, it just slid right off the build plate, no problem. But it held the entire time through. And so hearing that snap and that, that relaxing and that release off the build plate was a beautiful sound because we knew we were getting that first layer just right. And the design added to that just made it even better. Another factor to watch out for when you're starting to think about production is you need to know the profile of your build plate. This can be done simply with a thermal camera. You can get them on Amazon. You can, have, you can get apps that'll do this. And so it allows you to determine where your hot spots on your build plate are to target zones that might have um, more residual thermal stress, more curling for those zones, and not to put parts like that out in cool zones. So know where your heat is on your build plate. It's pretty easy to do and figure that out. Now, we will point this out. We don't like doing it. But if you are the type of folks that actually have to use a third party adhesive to hold your object down on your build plate, maybe it's blue tape, maybe it's glue, we definitely recommend you go the vertical stacked option because if you have to go that much effort to glue this thing down and get it to hold during production, you need to make it tall, make it worth your while. So long cycles, vertical stacking is a must. But when you're going to vertical stack, don't vertical stack in your slicer. 
because all it's going to do is add in support material and you don't want that. You're going to vertical stack, vertical stack in your design side, on your CAD software, whether it be Fusion or SolidWorks, whatever the case, that's where you want to be producing your uh, one on top of the other approach. Uh, Prusa has a good example of this. They took their headbands and they would actually taper them at the bottom and the top. So as you're printing one, it goes its normal width. And then as it gets near the top, it tapers down. The next one tapers back out like this. So you have a good support point, but something that is pretty easy to cut or break off once you actually have it off the build plate. So that's a design solution, not a slicer application. You also notice that they built in their own support material in their design side. So this thing was designed for or modeled as a stack of four or a stack of eight. That's where you want to be with yours too. You want to have your production designed for stacking. Another interesting thing that's kind of counterintuitive for 3D printing is that you have to stop getting excited about design changes. You know, with 3D printing, it's awesome. We're able to change something from one thing to the next, keep continuous improvement, which is what we're all about. And 3D printers are all about that too. You can change a part, make it better, make it better, make it better. But when you're switching to production mentality, especially if you have a small team, you need to change that mentality for, is it worth it? Is it worth it, me going through this whole process over, recoding everything, getting the nuances out just for a slight design change that may, may or may not be that beneficial? We ran into that a lot. We were asked, you know, hey, do you use this design? This improvement's just been made. Uh, are you going to get into like the face mask, that kind of thing? And we had to say no a lot because we had to keep the main thing, the main thing, and that was just for all production. So sometimes you have to resist that excitement, you know, that sketching around and coming up with a great idea and be like, oh, this is awesome, I wanna do this. You might have to suppress that for a while, unless it is a design change that really matters. And that would be one of the most justifiable is when you can consolidate. One of the biggest problems that we had in production was not the production itself, but was in the assembly. You know, we just didn't have manpower to put all this stuff together. So anything that we could have done to reduce the part count so that the 3D printer was making more of the component in one shot, the better. So if you have the software capability, generative and that kind of thing that you can combine your objects into one and one print and not have to assemble, that's the type of design change you definitely wanna do for your production. So let's move on away from that to production cycling. You know, what do you care about the most? And one of the biggest nemesis to, uh, production cycling and your success is going to be your filament run out. And uh, you know, it's the worst. You pr printing, you're printing, everything's going great. You didn't calculate correctly and your spool just ran out. Now you may say, well, I've got a filament run out sensor on it. And that's great, but that's not the solution. Quantity is solution. And one of the things that we probably uh, would have started sooner had we, had we really thought about it was getting large orders of filament. Maybe go into these three kilogram, five kilogram, what we call the, the Texas size rolls. In fact, actually the company is in Texas that makes some of these. Getting large quantity allows us to run continuously. We don't have that filament run out, shutting the printer down, and we get more bang for a buck. Now, having said that, if your environment you know, is open, you have to worry about you know, water absorption. So maybe throw in a dehumidifier into that space, keep the moisture out. Uh, you'll probably be just fine, but it's something to watch out for. Now, cycling also going back to that small team, large team fact. You know, I use this picture specifically because what you don't see is a person. The fact is when you're dealing with small teams, you want to plan for these printers running long, 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 long hours uh, unsupervised. And you want to minimize your up, up and cool down times as well. So we were generally running, uh, of course, we we're running 24-7, but we were running 24-hour cycles on a lot of our work, especially over the weekend, because we only wanted one person in there having to come in and clear and reset. And then normal work days, when there may have been more than one, we can go to eight or 16, depending on if you have like a morning, evening shift. But that's what you want with small teams. You got a small, you got a large team, you got somebody that can sit there and watch that printer all the time, then go for it. You, got, you can do shorter cycles. You can have simpler designs. You don't have to get so much into the design side of things. You obviously have more material savings because you can get right down to the end of that filament roll. And they are more friendly to design iterations because you have a team to implement. So that's the kind of difference between the two. Another thing that we found out that was kind of interesting because I know most of us, you know, we have lots of printers. We want to stack them. We want to put them up on these big racks, clear floor space, have this really cool looking thing. But what we found is linear layouts work out better. 
And for us, it wasn't a big deal. The pandemic basically had closed the building so we could use as many rooms as we wanted to. So the linear layout turns out to be a better layout because you're faster at clearing and resetting. You're also much better at seeing mistakes before they happen or seeing errors in the print because you're not dealing with shadowing effects of one printer over top of the other. Things are more open. You get more work done by laying them out linearly if you have the space. Another component to consider with all this, of course, is your maintenance. What do you want to do maintenance-wise in terms of your particular setup? Are you in a situation where you're okay with being proactive every two weeks or you know three weeks? You want to actually do maintenance on these things regularly, take them down, bring them back up, and schedule all that? Or do you want to be reactive? Do you just want to wait till something goes wrong and deal with it? What we found out in our case, in, in the use of all this production, is that we could actually be reactive because the printers were really good at just operating. They didn't have a lot of problems. So what we chose to do is just react to something going wrong. And uh, what basically would happen is we would see a clog or something, we pull that printer off, uh, one of the techs would take it home, work on it, bring it back the next day. We weren't really down. That one printer being down was not that big of a deal. And as a result, we were keeping going versus actually taking groups of them down or scheduled maintenance, which was harder, especially when dealing with a small team. So that's one of the things that we saw right off the bat. Now, it's not really a maintenance issue, but since that first layer is so critical in your production, then uh, you have to watch out for that. Now, if you have a printer that automatically self-levels and gets everything adjusted, then you're fine. But you know, a lot of your lower cost equipment, even though it's good, they generally have to be manually leveled. And so checking that about every 96 hours is something we saw viable because that first layer, layer really is the make it or break it point. And as long as you keep that first layer nice and tight by good leveling checks every now and then, then you had a higher, much higher success rate. Another interesting thing that we ran into, you know, certain cases we do use glue. We don't want to, but some cases we do use glue and adhesive, third party adhesives. And uh, one thing that we learned off the bat is how you clean them really, really matters. Uh, one time we actually went through, did a deep clean, cleaned everything with soap and water, got all the glue off, restarted, could not get anything to stick whatsoever. The fact is we were actually, I was getting a little panicky, you know, at, at that moment too, because it was just getting so frustrating. What we actually had to do was deep clean or do the soap and water clean off the, off the bed, get all that glue off of it, and then turn around, let it dry, and then clean with your typical alcohol. And after that, everything was back to sticking nice and neat and everything was great. So we do recommend the soap and water to really get that uh, glue off because the alcohol won't do that great of a job, but then let it dry, then throw the alcohol to it, and then you're ready to be back, back to the races. Another maintenance issue, of course, is your nozzle itself. Are you actually going through checking periodically to make sure the nozzle is clear? Because eventually you're going to get particulate in there that's going to degrade and cause problems with your extrusions. So having the kit to go through periodically, maybe every two weeks, just to kind of clear the nozzle, make sure it's good. Another thing to watch for, the, the early warning signs, or you start to see leaks of material around the joints of your hot end. You run your brass, maybe your heat block, uh, your thermal brakes. Just start looking around as you do that check. Make sure you're not seeing any material kind of squishing out or maybe running down the sides. That's the sign that you're about to have some major, either some major clogs or failures because the, the material is finding its way out. And so that's one of the bigger, big issues there. Now, as far as scheduling, that's totally up to you. And uh, you know, uh, this would be more of the proactive plan of, of taking care of it. Again, we found that reactive would work just fine and didn't cost as much downtime at all. So to kind of wrap it up, you know, just, and I just wanted a reason to throw in a 3D printed dress in there. You know, it all boils down to your decision making. Do you have a big team? Do you have a small team? In most cases, it's going to be a small business. So yeah, you're going to have a small team. So plan for typically large cycles and really spend more time on your design side, thinking about your slicing or thinking you're almost like your CAD software is a slicer at the same time and taking care of support material and vertical stacking in your design, not on your slicer, because that just creates more problems that you don't want to deal with. Thinking about your temperatures, your first layer speed, that's your hold down issues for adhesion. That's where you want to be. And to kind of wrap it up, some of our stats, you know, over the course of the, the pandemic shutdowns, we produced around over 7,000 face shield assemblies. Ran through 272,000 grams of filament, produced about 1,000 ear savers. 
And using the majority of our printers, we're generally $415 or less uh, readily accessible off the market. We did run 24 seven production and for the most part operated on two or less operators per day. And uh, Skeleton Crew is, is being generous in this process. And so, yes, you know, we know there are entities out there that were producing larger, larger numbers, but we think we're a little bit more reflective of the small business and the most of the institutions are gonna be like because that's what we found across our network. It was uh, small numbers of people using what they had to produce. We we're very proud, even though we had that small number of people and, and we're producing these kind of quantities, that we generally had an 8% or less failure rate once we got everything dialed in. So overall, it was an incredible experience to be a part of and uh, you know, very rewarding to be able to use additive to turn around and support our regions. You know, we were sending these things across the state, in our regions, of course, actually you know, across state lines as well. And it was great to be in the middle of that experience and answer that call. So um, that was our experience with this. And of course, if you wanna learn more about what we did and kind of what we do here at SCC and our additive movement, um, you definitely can check us out. Uh, here's all my social information. You can take a screen capture of it. Um, easy to find on LinkedIn. We have a YouTube channel called The Additive Guru that uh, provides all kinds of folks some information. And of course, we've got uh, folks with, you can actually just Google us with SCC 3D printing and find us pretty fast too. We push out a lot of the stuff that our students are doing and breakthroughs that are pretty useful and also potential workshops as well. And I want to kind of leave, leave you with this thought is that, that, you know, this pandemic has been a, a real turning point for Additive. It's made people realize what is possible and you can see it in the industry response. You see how many companies are starting to now buy into higher level equipment, buying up printers. The number of print farms that are being, you know, set up is drastically increasing. People have realized that this technology has the potential to step in and fill gaps wherever they are or allow someone to start up with a brand new business with hardly any infrastructure to begin with in terms of manufacturing. So thank you all so much for the opportunity to talk with you. Love to hear from you later on, hear your comments. Uh, check me out on uh, social media and uh, be glad to help you any way we can. Thanks to TTU and I wish you all a great afternoon and a great rest of the week. Thank you very much.